Someone just said happy birthday to me. Thank you. Well, I want to talk about another birth that's happening right now at Family Church. I mean, as we speak, there is a birth happening. I know it sounds disgusting, but play along with me, all right? Right now, this day, September 30th, is the birth of the South Umpqua campus. Whoa, whoa, stop, 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 whoa. We got a plan here. Hold it. You're going to do that in a second. All right. So, South Umpqua, there have been people across the county that have been sacrificing for you, giving for you, praying for you, and loving you, even if they don't know who you are. And over the last three years, we have been prepping for this, planning for this, and loving in your direction. And so, from across the county, your church wants to say something to you. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. On the count of three, you're going to say, Hi, South Umqua. Okay, you ready? You got it. One, two, three. Hi, South Umqua. Now you can clap. We really do love you, and we are so glad that you've chosen to be part of Family Church. Um, one of the things that you're seeing right now is you're seeing the pastor speaking to you on a screen, and I'm huge. Believe that. That's exactly what's real in life, okay? I am one of the tallest people you'll ever meet. Okay, remind me, never go to South Umqua. They'll know the truth because it ain't true. So, uh, hey, we're talking about family uh, culture specifically today. And have you ever noticed when you walk into someone's house and you break a family rule? There's one in particular that you usually know within four steps of entering the door. One, two, three, four, and you get the look. And it's not necessarily the woman or the man. It's whoever's the cleanest one. They look at you and the left eyebrow goes up and you know you've broken the rule. What's the rule? Take off your shoes. My wife, when she was 12 years old, had the wonderful opportunity to leave Roseburg, fly across the Pacific Ocean, and go to Shobu, Japan, our sister city. And she had a little opportunity to go there for um, extended weeks that she was a part of a family there in Japan. And she found that there were rules that they had uh, that she was not down with, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> One in particular. She didn't know if it was just this home or if it was the Japanese culture. But when she got there, she found out very quickly that the rule was that everyone bathed together. I love the look on your face. It's South Umquat and Green. I can't see you, but I know you're doing it too. Ooh. Exactly. And she said, mm, that's not how we play in our home. But she came smack dab into family rules. You know, uh, if you've ever been to Ross or Marshall's, you know that you can just buy family rules and you can pin them up and they look really nice. $7.99, by the way, Ross. And they say stuff like, um, do your best. Okay, that sounds good. But you know, every once in a while, you buy these things and you think, okay, those will be our family rules. But if you're not careful, notice right here, eat your peas. Are you kidding me? You know what? We don't even cook peas in our house in case they might get near our, our faces. We're not going to do that. You know why people buy peas? Or why you should buy peas? In case you hurt your knee and you got to put, right? You're with me? This one says peas and carrots. And I'm going to tell you right now, two wrongs don't make a right, okay? <laughs> That's not, just don't, don't even think about it. So here's the problem. When you try and buy your family values, when you try and buy your family rules, you'll end up with some things that say stuff like eat your peas. So you can buy a poster, but you have... <laughs> But you have to build family values. I just said something really profound and you missed it because you were laughing. Let me say it again. You can buy the poster, but you have to build your family values. And that's where we're going to look today. And uh, this is a great story. We're going to be in uh, Deuteronomy 6, which is the beginning of a culture being set. <coughs> a little background for you as we're looking at Deuteronomy. Uh, here's where we are in, in the timeline of history. Uh, sometimes with the Bible, we start thinking about the characters of the Bible as though they were all contemporaries, and they're not. I always think of like there was Moses, and then down the street lived David. In actuality, Abraham was about 1,800 years, Moses was about 1,500 years, and David was about 1,000 years before Jesus Christ. <coughs> and we're going to look at Deuteronomy, which was written at the very end of Moses' life. And a little background for you. The people of Israel had been enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years, and God tapped Moses on the shoulder and said, Hey, bud, Get in the game. And Moses went in before the leader of Egypt. His name was Pharaoh. And he said, let my people go. And after 10 plagues, the people of Israel left Egypt. They crossed through the Red Sea and came to the other side. <coughs> and then they made some poor choices. And in the process of those poor choices, they had to spend 40 years in the desert wandering around. 
And then at the end of that time, it was time to head into the promised land. Moses wasn't going to get to go in with them because of some poor choices he made. So this is the very end of his life. <clears throat> in those 40 years that they had wandered around, it was now time to retell what the laws would be, how to set this culture. The only thing the Israelites had known to this point was how to be Egyptian and how to be slaves. And they knew how to walk around in the desert. <coughs> and that's it. And he was going to say to them, you have to set your culture. You can't buy it at Ross. You can't go to Marshall's and pay $7.99 and post it up and say, that's who we are. It has to be more than that. So as he's talking, as Moses is laying down the law one more time, he says in, in Exodus or I mean, sorry, in Deuteronomy 6, he lays out a core principle foundation. Now, when we read the Bible in the Old Testament, it's tempting to think, hey, I need to set my family culture. I'll just read Deuteronomy. But the problem is Deuteronomy wasn't written to us. Deuteronomy was actually written by, by Moses. It was written about 1,400 years before Christ, which means it's 3,400 years old. It was written to Israel. It wasn't written to people in South Umqua and Green and Sutherland. It was written to them. But there's an underlying principle that we can take from it. But if you try and say, I'm going to read <coughs> Deuteronomy and make it my story, it won't work because you're not Jewish. You didn't just come out of slavery. You didn't just come out of 40 years in the desert. So you follow how this works? So it's written to Israel, but it's written for setting culture. So how we're going to divide this up and, and look at it, we're going to look at what's the underlying principle that we see in Deuteronomy 6. <coughs> now, I am going to be reading a little differently this, this week. Normally we read from the NIV, but whenever I'm prepping for a sermon, I'd like to read lots of different translations. Um, ESV is great for study. NIV is great for reading. NLT is really good for just hearing the heart of the story. But I was reading in the CEV, which is the contemporary English version, and we're going to read from that today. One of the things I noticed in Deuteronomy 6 is two things that really stood out. One of them is that the word obey in just this chapter came up seven times. And the word worship came up six times. And what I thought about, when you look at the culture of your family, your culture will be determined by two things. What you elevate, what you worship, and what you tolerate, whatever the rules are. And think about this on the elevate. You will elevate whatever you value. <coughs> so maybe it's something like, you want to check out what you already elevate? Don't think to yourself, well, what do I like? Where do you spend your time? Because some of you, your family values is you work and you work, and you work. Some family values, you've never worked a day in your life. We can tell by your home. You don't mind if we walk in with your shoes. Then on the other side, where does your time go? And then what do you celebrate? That's what you elevate. Then on the other side, so you have the tolerate idea. It's what you obey. What are those rules? But some of them go unnoticed. You ever notice the rules of the home? Rule number one, never talk to dad when he gets home from work because he's angry. Rule number two, never talk to mom when her left eyebrow's up. That's the indicator, right? And make sure you signal the rest of the family. Walk out. But you know that you have these underlying rules. I remember one family, I was talking with them. I was with them for one afternoon, and I can tell what the family rule. Rule number one was, mom fixes everything. See, what, what you elevate, what you tolerate. I was talking with uh, Pastor Skye from the South Umpqua campus, and he was saying one of the things you can realize about what you uh, tolerate is what kind of humor people will use. They were looking for child care. And so the beauty of today, you can do background checks yourself. You just go on Instagram and Facebook and you find out what they really believe. And he was doing some background checking on someone who was going to be maybe possible child care for his kids. And as he scrolled through, he found a joke. And then he read that joke. And then he looked at the responses of others. And then her responses. And he realized what you laugh at reveals what you tolerate. It was a powerful moment. And he said, hmm, We'll look somewhere else because what you elevate and what you tolerate reveals the culture. That's not a culture Sky wanted in his home. So as we look at this, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 6. We're going to come from uh, specifically the CEV. And I want you to look at um, some key verses in here. This week, I'd like you to read the whole chapter. We're going to pull out some of the, um, some of the key verses that we'll draw from. Um, starting in verse 4 and 5. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God is the only true God. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It starts with this. At the core of it, it's got to be in relationship with him. It also says, <coughs> memorize his laws and tell them to your children over and over again. Talk about them all the time. Whether you're at home or walking along the road or going to bed at night or getting up in the morning, talk about it. 
this, this heartbeat rule that he's giving you, this culture that he's giving you, it's got to be on your, your verbiage all the time. This idea of talk about it all the time. I love how they say when you're walking along the road, they didn't have cars, so their main mode of transportation was walking. But they, listen to this. In the morning and at night, when you're at home and when you're on the road. Is there any other time? It's either home or away, right? All of them... Be talking about who God is. Be talking about this culture. What does it mean to be a follower of God? <clears throat> write, them, write down copies and tie them to your wrists and foreheads to help you obey them. Write these laws on the door frames of your homes and on your town gates. And it says in 12, and don't forget. This is tempting. Don't forget what it was the Lord who set you free from slavery and brought you out of Egypt. And in 15, it says, If you worship other gods, the Lord will be furious and wipe you off the face of the earth. The Lord your God is with you. So don't try to make him prove that he can, that he can help you as you did at, at Massa. This is another time uh, in that 40-year process where they were processing whether or not they could trust God and he had to prove it. This is a strong, strong warning. So as we look at Deuteronomy 6, I see some real key heartbeat principles that we can look at for our families right now. The first one comes back to just the core heartbeat of it <coughs> from verse 5. It says in that verse 5, I want to read this again because that idea, pay attention, Israel. He says, so love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. It is the, the, uh, the core of what you'll need. And I want you to see this as a foundation. If you're going to build a house, if you don't build a foundation square and proper, you will have trouble for the rest of the building. If it's not level, you, nothing's going to be level. I was thinking about this. If you're going to have your family be better than it is now, the person that has the greatest chance to impact is the one sitting in your chair. I know you can think, well, I'm too young, or I'm too old, or I'm single. Your life and the family culture that's there is determined by the person that, that you are, the one that you looked at in the mirror this morning. Let me ask you this question. If the core of your life is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, what impact will that have on everyone else? But if you miss this one, you just go home now. There is nothing of any value you'll hear because the core of it all is whether or not your relationship with God is centered. And if you want to change your family, if you look at the direction and you don't like where it's headed, this is where it starts. And all the great advice and all the self-help books, throw them away. If it doesn't begin and end with love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with everything you are, then everything else is meaningless. It's, a, it's such a cool thought, too. And all the people in here, some of you may think about your family, and there's some, some people in here that are estranged from others. You know who it can help determine whether or not that heals? You. We, Paul came up with this axiom that I thought was so powerful. He said that the horizontal, how I treat others and how I relate to others, rests on the vertical. It makes a cross. He's saying how I relate to you and you and my family and my neighborhood is determined. It rests on how I relate with God. And when my heart is centered on him, when he is the passion of my life, now I'm in. And here's why so often families will begin to head in the right direction, but it won't last it's because everything breaks this way and suddenly the marriage is fractured and the relationship with dad is fractured and we say, I need help, and we run for help. But what we don't do is center our heart back and say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. What we try to do is we try to fix what's broken this way without fixing what's broken this way. And I'll say, if you don't have a relationship with God, he's the number one beginning point, the highest priority. If you want to save your family, it begins with giving your life towards him. So um, as we move forward, realize everything else we say, echo this back around. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and see it through that lens. When we talk about a few more principles of how you relate to your family, am I loving the Lord with my God with all my heart, soul, and strength? And if not, put a pause on everything else and come back and say, I have to pull that back to it. <coughs> the second thing, uh, that I think is so valuable and so powerful in this, is quite simply to tell the kids, talk about it on the road. Talk about it at home. Morning, evening. It says this in, in 6. It says, memorize the laws. And then tell them to your children. Talk over and over again. Talk about them all the time, whether you're at home, walking, getting up or in the morning, or laying down. 
<coughs> you have to continually, continually, continually be talking about it with your kids. Well, here's what's interesting. I think that there are two ways that this happens. One is you have to set, lock in certain times where that's what happens. In your home, where is the spiritual conversation happen? And if you don't plan it, it ain't going to happen. You'll have to go buy values on a poster. But if you want God to be a value in your home, when does it happen? <clears throat> One of the things we set out from before our kids could listen, I mean, they couldn't even really listen, from the day they were born, at night, every night, we read the Bible with our kids. We set the pattern early. And when my daughter was four years old, we came to the part where she heard again and again and again about the cross of Jesus Christ and how Jesus, living a perfect life, died on the cross and then rose from the dead for our sins. And she started asking about heaven. And we told them, well, you don't just get to go to heaven. Heaven is for those people who realize that they're sinners, that they do stuff that's wrong. And then we talk with our four-year-old about the stuff that she does wrong. She says, yeah, I do that. And then we said to her, you have to ask Jesus to be in charge of your life. And then we turned the light off and went to bed. See, what we did here is we have a pattern that's set up that says every night we're going to do it. So we didn't have to force her or try and manipulate her into becoming a follower of Jesus. We knew the next night we were going to have that dialogue. We didn't make it to the next night, though. We sat down at dinner, and I went to pray, and little Anna goes, Hold on. Can you please be quiet? I'm trying to ask Jesus into my heart. <laughs> so immediately, there's tears in some parents' eyes. But I'll tell you, it didn't happen where we finally had the conversation. My, my, my kid's finally talking with me about God. We'd been talking about God since before she could talk or hear or understand. So it, it sets for that. Where is the pattern in your home that says we do this? I was talking with a, a dear friend of mine. I didn't ask, get permission to share the story from his side. So I'll just say it a general thing. Right now, his family is making their family values. And we were talking about this sheet and like the idea that you can actually create your own. You can write your own <coughs> family values. But it has to be a pattern that you're setting. The other thing is you got to look for the opportunities you got to see those moments when the tender heart is there or when the mistake happens and you're in the, the conversation and you can say, can I tell you again about grace? Well, let me tell you what happened about Jesus on the cross. Let me tell you what God has done in my life. You have to continually tell the kids and tell the kids and tell the kids. And I know some of you are thinking that stage has already passed. No, it's not. I know some of you think my kids are, are older than 18 and they don't live with me. It's not over. It's not. Some of the most significant things have been said to me by my parents after I was 18, after I didn't live there, when they were still willing to challenge me and still willing me to point me back, willing to point me back at the goodness of who Jesus was. If you are past the age of that, having kids at home, don't think for a moment it's over. And for some of you who don't have kids, don't think for a moment it's not about other people's kids too. All over this community, at South Umpqua, in Green, here in Sutherland, there are people, kids, in desperate need to hear that Jesus loves them and that he died for them. So let me ask you, where's the plan? And what are you thinking for the future? I want to tell you a story. This lady right here came to the same understanding that my little daughter did. She came to realize that she was a sinner and she needed Jesus Christ in her life. And she admitted that she had lived a sinful life and that she needed him. And because of the cross... He was bridging the gap because when we're sinful, we can't have a relationship with God. But if we accept Jesus, he pays the price for us. <coughs> and miracle of all miracles, this lady became a follower of God. Wonderful, isn't it? A little echo story out of that, though. It didn't end with her. You see, she also had a little boy when he was 12 years old. She led him to Jesus Christ. Miracle number two, he realized he was a sinner and needed Jesus Christ and beautiful miracle, he grew up and had a little boy of his own. And that little boy grew up and became a follower of Jesus. And the story echoed through history where this little boy's grandmother, beginning two generations earlier, said, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus. And then he grew up and had a little boy. <laughs> and he grew up and became a follower of Jesus who had two little kids. And one of them, when she was four years old, became a follower and he became a follower when he was five, driving in a car. The biblical version of that is walking along the road. So let me ask you a question about your family. My great-grandmother never met me. And my great-grandmother never met my two kids. 
but I echo the legacy that she began. What's your plan for your family for the year 2083? Write it down. 2083. What's your plan? I will be dead. Or 115. I pick dead, okay? Given the option. I'm getting old. Turned 40. I'm already feeling it. Woke up this morning, sneezed, and broke two ribs. You know, I don't want to live to 115, but I'll tell you this. I want to know that what echoes out with these two is that I would hear for generations to come that they heard that they were sinners who were saved by grace because when Anna and Anderson grow up, they are walking along the road and in the morning and at night, they're telling their kids, can I share with you that you are a sinner and you need Jesus Christ? If you think about this in terms of specifically Deuteronomy, Moses, the end of his life, Deuteronomy is written. He had no concept in his mind of the man named David outside of his, the realm of his thinking. But 400 years later, David was living out the legacy that had been handed off by Moses in Deuteronomy, passing on, tell the kids, make sure that the kids tell the kids in fact, in verse 25, 20 through 25, he says, when the kids ask, why do we have these laws? Remind them what happened. Now, I'll tell you, it doesn't just go with uh, making sure that you tell the kids. Part of what you have to tell the kids is you have to tell them about the wins. You got to remember all the great things that God has done. <coughs> my first year that Chris and I were married, my parents were down and we were sitting on, along the North Umqua on one summer day. And we were just ta talking and chatting. And the stories turned to some things that my parents had lived through in their first year of marriage. Some of the ways that God had provided. My parents were telling Thanksgiving stories in the middle of summer. Telling how God had provided and covered for them. <coughs> One of the ways when they had no money. Uh, they got their first home. And those of you who don't understand how to buy a home. But back in the day, you used to be able to do something that was really cool. You used to be able to assume the loan of the person who owned the home before you, which meant they bought the house 15 years into the loan, which meant they were paying massive principal instead of interest. A beautiful, I don't even know if my dad understood the concept at the time, but a beautiful way that God had provided for my family. And then out of that, the, the down payment from that when that house sold and they moved back to Portland. And anyways, as we sat there, you know what we heard? We heard about the winds. We heard that God is faithful and we don't have any money. We get it, but you still have him. You can trust God. That was the story they were telling. So when you look at your family, do you have a place for celebrating the wins? I'm going to say that I want every family to go out and buy one of these. Um, if you don't already have one, it's called a refrigerator. <laughs> I don't care what you put in it, but I am incredibly interested in what you put on it. Because this is the greatest trophy case ever created you know, it's funny. So I was thinking about this and this principle of the idea of the trophy case. And uh, I went to take a picture of it. And sure enough, Anna won an award for, I think it's integrity. And Anderson won an award for responsibility. There it was. I took the picture just because I wanted to make sure that we talked about. Have a place where you say, we win. I, freshman year of college, uh, early on in trig, I, I struggled a bit. About my third test, I aced it. Guess where that went? On the fridge. I don't care if I'm 19, put it on the fridge. That's right, big win. This needs to be a place, and let me tell you something. Husbands, wives, when your spouse kills it, and just, by the way, for those of you who don't understand, kill it is a positive thing. When they just absolutely do something awesome, put it on the fridge. Write something and say, you're the greatest spouse, and stick it on there. This is a place to celebrate. Let me ask you, if you're going to have family rules that you don't buy somewhere else. Is celebration part of it? I'm going to tell you, you have to look for the moments, though. And remember how I talked about those moments, either when they've done something wrong? Sometimes it's about remembering the wins that matters a lot. Oh, yeah. We had a, a real special. The UCC run was yesterday. <coughs> and uh, my kids uh, were a part of the, the, the kid run, which was great. And they were really excited about it, except for one part. The night before, Friday night, uh, my daughter came in... Uh, having uh, thrown up all over her room. Uh, and she had the good kind where it came out her nose too. I mean, she was in pain. She, was, she had a rough night. So the day before the race, my daughter's throwing up. So the next morning we know that she's not running. But we're tough. So she's going to go watch. And so she goes and watches. 
and well, she's watching the other race, and then a few minutes before her, the race she's supposed to be in, she gets up out of the chair and heads over to the starting line and says, okay, let's go. And despite having been sick the night before, she ran. And my little six-year-old, he didn't throw up. He was ready to go. And he was at that line, and he was so ready. He was so ready, so ready. He made it about 20 steps. And then he's the one here biting it hardcore. <laughs> now, when you're 20 steps into a race, and you bite it, and you've got skin on your knee and your elbow, and the funniest thing, he also scraped a little bit on his pinky. That's what he kept showing me later. Look at my pinky. When you're 20 steps in, you know what's really easy to do? To get back up and go find mom and go have a good cry. But he got back up and he finished the race. So that the kids did that is nice. Maybe that's a story I'll tell on Sunday. That wasn't the key part. After the race and everyone disseminated a little bit right there in the middle, we, we did a family huddle and I said, come in here. I said, yeah, I want to tell you how proud I am of you that you were throwing up out your nose and the next day, you got up and you ran the race. And I said, hey, little man, I'm so proud of you. You bit it hardcore. And you got back up. Because Irwins finish what they start. And we talked about who we are. So when you have your little list that you're going to put on the wall, do you have moments where you pull them together and say, that's who we are. Nice job. I'm so proud of you. And I was proud of them. But it's important that they know it. Far too often, man, and I know that I taught my father's generation, dad and mom didn't say that. And I'd say this, I don't care if your kid's grown and gone. Tell them. Celebrate the wins. Look at what God has done in their life, and you will help them move along. Another thing that I want you to see is, comes out of the end of that chapter, or <laughs> actually, guys, more, I guess, right in the middle of that, but in, in 15 and 16, he, uh, he kind of jumps the rail and says, hey, when you head into this new land that you're going to get. He tells them, you're going to get houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant, livestock that you didn't raise. You're going to get some good stuff, but let me give you a caution. And in 15 and 16, listen, it says, if you worship other gods, the Lord will be furious and wipe you off the face of the earth. The Lord God is with you, so don't try to make him prove it to you. Over and over and over again, this will be one of the key challenges for these people. Will they follow the distracting voices of those who are already in the land? Or will they say, I am a follower of God? Let me tell you, the people in your family will have voices trying to lead them somewhere else. Are you willing to eliminate those other gods? <coughs> to eliminate the dangers? As you play this out, I want you to consider one, I want you to consider two specific ways that we do this. One of them, I want to challenge the amount of time that we have on our screens. You used to say TV. Now you say, okay, to your kid, okay, you just lost your TV. And they're like, no problem. They pull out their phone and they're like, okay, I'll, I'll stream it. Thanks, Dad. But the amount of time that we're on our screens for two reasons. One of them is for the content on it. And I want to give a huge caution of what you're allowing into your home. And it's not just something that's sexual, though that is a caution you must have. But it's also the attitude that's pervasive in it. And if you're going to have it in, you better talk about it. When I was a kid, there was this nasty show. My dad was a Baptist pastor. Okay, so a little background for you. There was this nasty show that you should not let in your home. It was called The Simpsons. That was hilarious. This is what it was. But here's the problem. That show had an attitude that was negative. But you know what I've heard a lot of families, what they chose to do? Oh, we watched it, and then we talked about it. And what they did is they looked at culture, and they said, we're going to filter this through the lens of who Jesus was. I actually heard a pastor, McDonald, said, um, I, my kids would get in trouble if they didn't watch The Simpsons because we had to have this thing that we're going to dialogue against culture. But I want you to think about this. Inside your home, when it comes to what you watch, anything sexual, you need to be extra careful. And number two, whatever the attitude is, is someone trying to lie? Talk about that. Be aware of that. And the final thing that I want you to be aware of is that when your kids walk out the door, <coughs> whether they're 18 walking out the door or when they're six walking off to kindergarten, they will hear voices that are not yours. And do they know how to eliminate the danger? When I look at my six-year-old 
and I drop him off at Hughcrest Elementary, I know there will be people saying something to him and asking him to do stuff like kick in line, which is a really big deal for a six-year-old, but asking him and telling him you should do stuff that dad said not to. So you know what we say to our kids when we drop them off? Remember who you are. Remember things like the race where you puke and you keep running or you, you fall down and you get up and you keep running. Remember who you are because Irwins tell the truth and Irwins help people and Irwins don't give up. What is it about your family? And when you look at what that is, do they know it and do they believe it and do they live it? That's the only way those kids who at one point will turn 18, 19, 20, 41 for some and finally finally walk out the door, and when they do, will your voice echo in their heart because you've already said it over and over and over again that we are sinners who need the grace of Jesus Christ, that we are people that fall down but we get back up? Is the culture set or are you just wandering about? I want to give a real important pause, and I said this earlier, but I want to restate it again. When it comes to those of you when your kids are outside your home, lean back in. It's not over. Your influence is more significant than anyone else. And if you've lost your influence, lean back into the relationship. And I'm going to tell you a real quick story of Andy Stanley, who was a pastor of a really big church. His father was Charles Stanley, who was the leader of a really big church. And Andy used to work for Charles, and they had a falling out, and they were so mad at each other. But every week, Charles called Andy and said, let's go to lunch. And the hard part was they didn't have a lot to talk about because neither of them liked sports and they didn't really like each other. But every week, Charles leaned back in and leaned back in and he didn't give up on the relationship that was broken. If your relationship is broken with your kid, lean back in. It's not over. God still has you both here on this earth for such a time as this. We got a couple challenges that I want to give you. As we do that, I want to release to South Umpqua and to Green. I love you guys. Uh, take it away, Sky and Jason. That was so cool. We just said bye to South Umpqua. Man, we have three campuses now. <coughs> a couple challenges that I have for you. One of them is we're going to do something different. This is also on your devotions. Day number one, we want this to be a family challenge. Everyone in here, we want you to memorize James 1.19. This will help your family. I guarantee it. It's very simple. It says... Brothers and sisters, you should take note of this. You should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Raise your hand if your family needs more of those three things. And we've got some liars in this area. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I am following you. You will be held accountable on this. I want every part of Family Church memorizing this. I want all of your kids to be memorizing this. I challenge you, if your kids live far away, to have them be part of it. Brothers and sisters, you should take note of this. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The next thing I want you to do, I want you to pull out your Connect card. Don't turn it in yet. You're going to need it. <coughs> the next thing we're going to do is we're going to write down what's the best thing that you're doing in your home. This is your chance to... Uh, not really brag, but your chance to share it with others. At the end of the sermon series, we're going to compile a list of the best of the best... And then we're going to hand it out so that maybe you can take an idea from someone else. I'm going to share one of them with you from our home <coughs> while you're thinking about it. Ours is blue plate night. All it takes to have a blue plate night is a blue plate. And the way that you do it is you set it down at the table. And whoever sits at the blue plate is the person of honor that night. Because I want to have a place where we encourage, where we point out what things do well. So when you sit at the blue plate... Everyone around the table says, you know what I appreciate about you? I love the way that you saved the last bite of your cookie and brought it home for me. It's actually really disgusting, if you're wondering, when they get it at Fred Meyer and it sits in their car seat. And then they're like, Daddy, I, got, I saved this for you. <laughs> but you say what you appreciate about them, and the next person says, I appreciate that you, you're a hard worker. I appreciate that you're funny. And it gets back. We have a new thing. Crystal just started this in the last, uh, the last couple months. When you have the blue plate, at the end, you have to say what you appreciate about yourself and what God is changing in you. Oh, that gets uncomfortable, especially for the adults. So the kids are like, 
I like that I'm fast. I mean, they, they're on it. But as you go around, so when people come over, you'll often find a blue plate sitting in front of one of them. And we have a chance to, to honor and speak to them about what they often really, really, really need. So you're writing those down. <coughs> and we'll collect those in just a second. First, I'm going to pray for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the grace of Jesus Christ. That three generations ago, you spoke to a woman and you said, you need me. And she said yes, and then she passed it on to her son, who passed it on to his son. And I thank you for that night when dad came into the room and told me about Jesus. And as I was asking questions, he pointed me to you. God, I pray for the families that will echo out of this room in 2083. I pray that our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids and our great-great-grandkids would be followers of you. That it would be because of some things that began now, because we talked about it along the road, that we said, I'm going to love the Lord my God with all my heart, and it will be the passion of my life. And all the other stuff, we'll just put to the side. God, I pray for those who are living in the dangerous place. Pray that you'd give us the courage to eliminate what needs to be eliminated and to stand where we need to stand. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.